Coming up on Garden Talk. It has been well documented that there are 92, maybe more naturally occurring elements on Earth, wherein 82 of which have been found in plants. And then the plant says, okay, guys, if you just give me a tiny bit of nickel and a little bit of biology, I can turn your trash that you're giving me into something usable. And we always try to say it's some, it's 20% silt and it's and it's 10% clay and it's all these things. All those things creates a magnetic charge. And if you have biology, we talk about your EC increasing because your biology and your magnetic charge and your magnet gets stronger and stronger. You'll even start to see the anthocyanin is the purple starting to appear in the leaves. But what you're not going to see is you'll see a, a huge reduction in, in essential oils. What's up, everybody? For you that don't know me, my name is Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk podcast. This is episode number 78. In this episode, I interview Mark Boutwell from Perfect Gardens. He has been on the podcast once before, episode number 28, and a countless number of you have requested for him to come back for a part two. This time around, he picks up right where he left off, talking about some of the essential nutrients for plants. He also touches upon what deficiencies and toxicities look like for those nutrients. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. AC Infinity is sponsoring this episode. My entire ventilation system is AC Infinity. I have their inline fan, ducting, and carbon filter. I love the controller with the temperature and humidity programming and having control of different fan speeds. This makes it so much easier to control my grow environment. And I can't wait for the controller 69 Wi-Fi version, which also controls their oscillating fans and grow lights. You can use discount code Mr. Grow It for any of their products on their website acinfinity.com or use discount code MrGrowIt15 if you're buying off Amazon. Spider Farmer is sponsoring this episode. Coupon code MrGrowIt5 will get you a discount on their products. Check out their SE series which are bar style LED grow lights. They have the SE3000, a 4 bar fixture for a 3x3 grow space. The SE5000, a 6 bar fixture for a 4x4 grow space. The SE7000, an 8 bar fixture for a 5x5 grow space and the SE1000W, a 10 bar fixture for a 5x5 grow space. Check out the website at spider-farmer.com or search for them on Amazon. And don't forget to use the discount code MrGrowIt5 for a discount on their products. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with Mark from Perfect Gardens. How are you doing today? Doing good, brother. Thank you so much for letting me come back on the channel for part two and I just also wanted to say thank you so much to your community for, for asking for a part two. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. Uh, this is your second time on the podcast. First time was a big success. You know, lots of people in the comment section demanding for that part two. So here we are, part two. Uh, the first episode we did together, you talked about some of the essential nutrients for plants. And you also touched upon what deficiencies and toxicities look like for those nutrients. We covered so many of these elements, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, iron, calcium, manganese, and copper. So we got a whole bunch done. Still a lot more to go. Mark actually created a presentation for this. So if you'd like to follow along, I'll put a link to the presentation in the description section below. And if you're on one of the podcast platforms, find this episode on YouTube in order to access the link to the presentation. I'll show what I can on the screen this time, but if there are any slides that YouTube might not like, I'll leave those ones out. So let's continue where we left off, essential elements for plants, part two. And I think you've snuck some non-essential elements in there too. So uh, I'm excited to see what you got in there. But yeah, I'll, I'll let you roll on with the presentation. I know there's a little bit of an introduction in there and stuff, which will help for those that didn't catch the first episode we did together. So take it away. Chris, thank you so much. And just like you said, if you haven't checked out the part one, I highly recommend to do so. On this presentation, we are going to talk about a couple things we talked about in part one. The only reason why we're talking about it again, though, is because I don't, I didn't think I did a good enough job um, really going through it and explain the significance. So this time around, 
we're going to do a much better job. So the title of this is Deficiencies, Toxicities, Minerals, and Biology, presented by Mr. Growit and Perfect Gardens. Like uh, Chris said, if you're not following along, the description is down below. If you put your email in, you're going to get three things. You're going to get the presentation. You're going to get a free visual plant guide. So something you can actually, um, a lot of times you, you, you don't know the deficiency name, but you know what you're looking at. So what we did is we created a visual plant guide so you can actually, what you're seeing, you can reference it, scroll over, and then see whether it's a deficiency of toxicity and most likely what it is. In addition, you're going to receive a free audio book all about minerals for plants and for the human body. I want to do a special thanks to the Army of Growers that have helped make uh, this presentation what it is. Special thanks to Dave Hansen, Ken, Hayes, Mike, Emily. Emily actually helped create the visual plant guide, so just special thanks to him as well. Av, Sai, and the rest of the team. So Perfect Garden's culture, you've heard me say this before. Our vision, can a farmer solving the world act problems. Our mission is we are, we are here to help you grow. Our values are integrity, putting the shopping cart back every time, sustainability, doing our due diligence, and being present. One problem, one solution at a time. We are an army of growers. So what is Perfect Gardens? Perfect Gardens is an online retail store and a growing community. Our mission is to help you grow. One of those ways is by using, testing, and teaching you about products that will help create long-term regenerative practices. We think that 90% of the products sold in most gardening stores are just there to have you repurchase it the following year. Throughout this presentation, we'll be talking about a few brands we support. We are not saying that you should purchase these products. We are saying that you should look at the raw materials of what these products are created from and then start there. We hope that by guiding you to purchase high quality products, it will in one part help fulfill our mission here at Perfect Gardens, which is to help you grow. Okay, so we're going to talk about the law of minimum real quick one more time. And we're going to give some examples around the law of minimum because I think by giving these examples at, in the beginning of this presentation, it will make the rest of the minerals uh, as we go through them a lot more efficient and easier to understand. So the law of minimum states that growth is dictated not by the total resources available, but by the scarcest resource. Today we'll be talking about the five most limiting factors that support enzyme production. 80% of the deficiencies, toxicities, bugs, mold, low yield, and crappy quality are because of a lack of enzymes. Those five most limiting factors are one, carbon slash humic layer, two, clean and consistent watering practices, three, ionic sulfated minerals, four, biology, and five, CO2. Okay, so you've heard me say this before. The most unique thing about the canning industry is the testing of our terpene profiles. The reason why is because more terps means higher overall plant health. We are talking about nutrient density, not just the weight of the yield. In this presentation, we are going to be going from academics to application. Knowledge is not power, it is the application of knowledge that's power. And through this presentation, I'm going to be encouraging you to take more action. The brands below are supported by us because they help fix the five most limiting factors. Pit moss. Pit moss is a little fibrous paper and it's your carbon, it's your consistent watering, it's your water conservation, and it's the future home for your microbes and minerals to complete their enzyme production cycle, which is 24 hours. We recommend to don't, uh, don't start over 5%. Uh, start with 5% of pit moss in your total media and then slowly add in over time. Drops of balance. Drops of balance is 64 plus negative ionic sulfated minerals. Plus, it cleans over 400 separate man-made chemicals out of your water. Terraganics, terraganics, specifically EM1, more than 80 separate bacteria colonies. We always recommend an Indo fungi. There's lots of brands out there that have Indo fungi. We recommend either Recharge or, or Mycos from Extreme Gardening. And then last but not least is Organic Shield. Organic Shield is a complete IPM product that will take care of any of your bugs. In addition to this though, when it breaks down, it breaks down into water, CO2, and sugar. That being the fifth most limiting factor. Okay, so you have seen this picture if you have downloaded the presentation before. In this situation though, I actually added a few more things to help give the visual representation between the relationship between bacteria, minerals, and enzymes. So let's explain this real fast. 
Enzymes are responsible for breaking apart and rewelding DNA, RNA, amino acids, peptides, and protein bonds. Every enzyme needs enzyme cofactors. Bacteria make enzyme cofactors. All enzyme cofactors are dependent upon the amount of trace minerals in the environment. These enzymes can perform their tasks hundreds of times before degrading in the plant. It has been well documented that there are 92, maybe more, naturally occurring elements on Earth, wherein 82 of which have been found in plants. So just, you got to think about that for a second. If plants took up those 82 separate minerals, then that means bacteria at some point made them water soluble so that the plant could take them up. And the plant wouldn't take it up if there wasn't a purpose for them. The next slide real quick also talks a little bit around visual around your DNA, RNA, proteins, amino acids. And then we're going to explain real fast what this is. Your DNA is responsible for storing and transferring genetic information. RNA directly codes the amino acids and acts as a messenger between DNA and the ribosomes, which are large and complex enzymes to make proteins. All interactions need bacteria and cofactors. Amino acids plus enzymes bond together in two or three to make peptides. Peptides plus enzymes bond together to become complete proteins. All of this happens in a 24 hour cycle. And so the most important thing to understand about this is that the bacteria and the minerals need to stay in the same spot with a consistent water source for that enzyme reaction to complete its job in that 24 hour cycle. And if one of these things goes out of whack, that production cycle has to restart or it's incomplete. Okay, so let's talk about the law of tolerance. Let's give a quick definition of what this is. A law stating that the abundance or distribution of organism can be controlled by certain factors where levels of these exceed the maximum or minimum limit of tolerance of that, of that orgasm. So what does that mean exactly? Well, just like how we talked about before, there are zones of intolerance and then there are the tolerance range and then there's the optimum range. And so let's give us some examples. So example is like pH. If you have a pH of three or a pH of nine, there's probably in the zones of intolerance and your plants are gonna die fairly quickly. But if you have, let's say a pH of 5.6 and 7.3, that's more the zone of the tolerance range. The plant's still going to grow, it's still going to do its job, but it's pro you're probably not gonna see the full potential. And if you are in that optimum range of 5.8 to let's say 6.6, .6, where the ma majority of the minerals are available, well, that's gonna be your optimum range, and you're probably gonna see a, a better potential of what that plant could do. Other examples are temperature. If it's too hot or it's, it's too cold, you can imagine what happens, starts to happen, deficiencies. If your light intensity, your photons, your DLI, your daily light integral is too much. So if you're giving too little of light, what's going to happen to the plant, right? And if you give too much light, what it, what's going to happen to the plant? And the, the plant has, has different expressions uh, throughout this. So if the plant doesn't have a lot of photosynthesis going, we're going to see it in a deficiency. But if it's too much light, we're probably going to see te uh, a tacoing or, or the plant's going to say, hey, li listen, it's a little too much light for me. The last one I want to bring up is the magnetic charge or the parts per million or the EC. All of these are really important to understand around minerals and that's what pretty much the rest, the rest of the presentation is going to be about. I think one that I'd like to throw in there relates to the temperature and actually relative humidity would be VPD. A lot of people chase after VPD. If you don't know what that is, Google it. Check out the VPD charts. There's different charts for you know, seedling stage, vegetative stage, flowering stage, for example. But it's basically at a certain temperature, what is the ideal humidity that you should be at? And on the chart, there's a dark green range, there's a lighter green range, and then there's a, a yellow or red range. So I thought that was a good example I'd figure I'd throw out there. I, I love that, Chris. Actually, the reason why I love that is because your, your brain headed to exactly where I was hoping it would go. Uh, right into VPD as being the next example of how these all play out. So that was phenomenal. I know that the presentation's working. Uh, so, <laughs> so magnets, um, and let's give an example around the law of tolerance around magnets. And we're going to play into right, right exactly what Chris is talking about, temperature and VPD. So your magnets, uh, phosphorus is your dominant macro negative at ion magnet. Calcium is your dominant macronutrient positive cation magnet. 
when you balance your phosphorus, all of the other negative ions can be balanced. So that means all of the other trace minerals that have a negative charge can be balanced if phosphorus is balanced. If, if calcium is balanced, that means all the other minerals that have a positive charge that are smaller than calcium can be balanced. But when one of those is off, remember we're talking about the law of tolerance, too much phosphorus, too much calcium, all the rest starts to get thrown off. So now let's go into how, how does the magnet play into the relationship around temperature and VPD. So as calcium gets warmer, it gets heavier and its positive charge get, uh, starts to get neutralized because of additional negative electrons it collects. When the leaf temperature is above 86 degrees Fahrenheit, plants will go from photosynthesis to a respirative state. At this point, calcium stops being taken up by the xylem and the calcium already taken up starts to settle into the oldest growth of the plant until calcium can gain back its full positive cation charge. In addition, it gets lighter, calcium will get lighter in density as it cools by the losing of the electrons and new calcium is able to flow all the way back up the xylem, attracting the negative ions back up with it. In addition, you may also see leaves deform in new growth because your VPD is off. So this is where I'm trying to now relate to the language of, the, of, of where all of us are talking about, but I'm also connecting it with the science right here. Uh, you may also see purple leaves, purple pedials, and the fading from the bottom up due to a lack of flow of calcium and boron and its relationship to the speed of ATP production and the robbing of phosphorus because it is a mobile nutrient. So what does that all mean, example, right? So when it gets too warm, the calcium stops flowing up the xylem and it settles back down the plant. But the plant is still doing ATP production, right? ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So how does it get new, pho a new phosphorus? It robs it from the bottom of the plant and takes it up so that if it gets too hot, you may start to see phosphorus deficiencies for this reason because it's starting to cannibalize itself to continue to keep doing its job. Calcium and phosphorus flow together like a positive and negative magnet. Calcium and phosphorus flow together until phosphorus and other micronutrients are released and taken up in the sap of the plant called the phloem. So the xylem, is, the xylem is the transportation of water and minerals. The phloem is the sap where the chemical reactions, the enzymes, do their job. So in between it, and we've done a number of videos showing on, on that, that when you see the xylem and the phloem, the bacteria are traveling in between them constantly. And the reason why is because they're, they're, they're the intermediate between the xylem and the phloem. All magnets, minerals, need to be present in a 24-hour period to complete their enzyme reaction and cellular construction. Temperature to optimize en enzymatic activity is between 76 and 83 degrees Fahrenheit. So all of you guys have seen this slide. Uh, the biggest thing to pull from here is the question you need to ask yourself when you see a deficiency and a toxicity. Is the deficiency or toxicity appearing in the older or newer growth? Immobile nutrients sh shows uh, their deficiencies or excess in the newer leaves. Mobile deficiencies show up as a deficiency or excess in the older leaves. Semi-mobile semi can show up in, in, in the older or newer leaves. So just understand that question. If you understand the question is, where am I seeing it? You are able to eliminate literally half your problems almost immediately. Okay, so now let's get into the first mineral or really the continuation of the minerals from part, uh, part one. The, the reason why is, once again, is because when you understand the, what I explained up top, it's going to make the language and everything I read here, it's going to be able to flow in like you're just reading a, the best book you have ever read or the watch the best movie you've ever seen. Okay, so zinc aids in enzyme production that are responsible for driving many metabolic reactions in all crops. Growth and development would stop if specific enzymes were not present in plant tissue. Carbohydrates, proteins and chlorophyll formation is reduced in enzyme deficient plants. The significance of zinc stems from its property as a divalent positive cation magnet, which means that zinc ions can form two chemical bonds with a, a with an ion. Ions are molecules that have a negative magnetic charge. 
More trace minerals being present helps the release of other minerals at a ion exchange site. When zinc is present, it helps release and hold two other negative minerals. So you kind of have to think about this. When you have a big mineral, it doesn't do a really good job at holding on to the smaller to tiny minerals. You actually need, as you go farther and farther down, the smaller the mineral, you it needs to go uh, actually be able to hold on to those smaller magnets. And that's why it, it's a, it's important to understand that the, the bigger ones can't really hold on to the smaller ones very well. So zinc is the zinc. They, you can also call these things chelating agents, right? They they this another word that that works in this in this expression of trying to understand what I'm what I'm trying to say here. Zinc helps soil structure because it increases the magnetic charge in the attracting and the releasing of other minerals. When smaller magnets are present, it creates a stronger magnet that is called our humic layer and is why we have to return what we take. And I hope that makes sense. Your humic layer is just a composition of all these magnets. And we always try to say it's 20% it's silt and it's 10% and it's clay and it's all these things. All those things creates a magnetic charge. And if you have biology, we talk about your EC increasing because your biology and your magnetic charge and your magnet gets stronger and stronger. Zinc is an immobile nutrient. So look to the newer leaves first to identify a deficiency in toxicity. If you're wondering, zinc is found in Drops of Balance. And if you're over there on dropsofbalance.com, make sure to type in Mr. Grow It uh, for additional discounts because all of the products that we're talking about today are available on dropsofbalance.com. Also on Perfect Gardens as well. Okay, so the zinc. Zinc, I, I tried to find a picture that really represents a zinc deficiency because I'm, these these deficiencies and toxicities are going to appear in your plant specifically during certain times because of the of the enzyme, enzymatic production that these minerals specifically do during vegetative state or flowering, right? So I tried to find a picture that would is actually going to you'll actually most likely see uh, versus providing too many pictures. And the one that really is going to pop out and you see it, you're going to be like, okay, that's a zinc deficiency. You're also, you're often going to see the stem tips fail to elongate and grow and grow shoot tips. They become bunched up and you, and you'll, you'll know what I mean. It just goes like, it goes like this. And it's just, it's really the only mineral deficiency that does that. Okay. So the next one, the benefits of molybdenum. Important in microbial nitrogen assimilation part of the nitrogen fixation cycle. So due to the presence of nitrogenase, the enzyme that performs the N2 fixation to the NH3 ammonia and the nitrate reductase, the enzyme that performs the first step in the nitrate NO3 negative. So it turns the nitrate NO3 negative to a nitrite NO2 negative. So just to kind of understand this, right? So just molybdenum itself, it helps use the the gas that's abundant in our air to make it more available for the plant okay so i find that to be incredibly incredibly important um and then we were talked about right these two enzymes there are these two bacterias create these enzymes that uh, allow molybdenum to to be utilized to its full potential so remember we we're talking about what's that most limiting factor is enzyme production it is also important to potassium absorption because the same bacteria that does the nitrogen fixation also breaks down the potassium mineral and makes them water soluble through the cation exchange. So really understanding the point here, right? So if you have a couple bacteria, these few bacteria can solubilize, make these minerals water soluble. And just and if you have one bacteria, it's capable of producing five, ten, hundreds of enzymes, hundreds of enzymes, if, you, if there, you just have the right mineral in that environment. And we, as we go into the, the next few slides, uh, I'll explain more about that. You normally will see a zinc deficiency with Mo because of the role they both play in photosynthesis. Why should you care about Mo? Well, Australia went from a wheat importer to a wheat exporter in one year just by adding molybdenum. Okay, and if you're wondering, molybdenum, yes, is in drops balance. 
So, so you got to understand this, okay? Molybdenum is used in very, very, very tiny amounts. If you use too much, it can get it, your plants won't do well. It will become very toxic for the plants. But just by adding this very small amount, an entire country that had to import wheat the very next year went to being able to sell wheat. So if you're wondering whether this trace mineral can increase your return on investment, yes, it can. It can boost your return return investment because it's gonna, it can help boost your yield. Molybdenum is a mobile nutrient, so look to the older leaves first for your deficiencies and toxicities. And so remember, molybdenum, um, it's a mobile nutrient. And the picture, once again, I tried to find it is it represents the plant, when you see it, uh, a molybdenum deficiency, it'll look like the plant is aging, but it's not maturing. And what I mean by that is when you see the plant, you're going to see the, uh, the uh, like our plants, you'll see the pistils coming out. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to think like the plant's maturing, like it's getting ready to be harvested. You'll even start to see the atherocyacin is the purple starting to appear in the, in the leaves. But what you're not going to see is you'll see a, a huge reduction in, in essential oils. And that's what I mean, right? The plant's maturing or the plant's aging, but it's not maturing. And that's, and that's what I mean by the difference. So you, it's very distinguishable. When you see the molybdenum deficiency, you'll know exactly what I, what I mean, mean when, I, when you see this picture. And YouTube isn't going to allow me to post this picture. So this is going to be one that you're going to want to download the presentation for. Or just li click on the link to access the presentation for. So you can see it's a very interesting picture here. It's one of the rarer ones is this type of deficiency so uh, once you see it you might have come across it in the past but it's it's very rare so there's a good chance that you didn't come across this chris is 100 percent right in our group we we are have clients now worldwide all in our membership group and we must have seen a linkedin deficiency maybe twice out of i don't know four or five hundred uh gross throughout the whole year so if you think about that that was like they probably grew two or three times in the same spot. So out of 1,200 separate grows, we must have seen a molybdenum deficiency two, two times. So it's, so it's really just, you're not going to, you, you, might, you, you might not see it, but just understand that that trace mineral, if it's applied appropriately with the right bacteria, it can increase your, your yield. And that's what's gonna happen with a lot of the rest of these minerals that we talk about on this presentation. They're not going to appear in your plant um, whether it makes it green or makes it tall or produces the flowers, it's, uh, they appear in, in the plants differently through the taste, the, the overall quality, the terpene profiles. Uh, you, you, you see them, they, they represent themselves in a, in a different level, in a different expression, not just in the yield, they, they represent themselves in another way. So benefits of manganese. Magazine aids in more than 300 enzymes that regulates the human body and plants. So we remember what we're talking about. You have a bacteria and you have manganese. It can produce 300 enzymes for you. Just, just these two things. That's, that's huge. And those enzymes go on to do their function hundreds of times before the plant degrades it. I found that to be incredibly fascinating. Without manganese, chlorophyll cannot capture sun energy for photosynthesis. We covered this in presentation one, but I, I wanted to bring it back up because we're talking about enzymes. And this is what, I'm, what we're talking about. The most limiting factor in, in most gardens is enzyme production. And what, why is this so significant for me? And I always love to re-say re this is it, it, capturing light. What is light? Light is harmonic frequencies. So magnesium is the receiver. So plants are, are listening to music all day long. This is proof, in my opinion, that plants do like music. Plants interpret the music they are listening to by the trace minerals and the microbes that are present. When you have bacteria and manganese, they are capable of creating, once again, over 300 enzymes. Absolutely amazing. Manganese is an immobile nutrient, so look to the newer leaves first to identify deficiencies and toxicities. In trace amounts, that's all we need. Remember, trace amounts. So manganese, so we've seen this deficiency probably no more than 10 times this year. So again, this is not something you're going to see a lot. And a lot of people are going to see this uh, and they might think it's a calcium deficiency. And calcium and, and manganese are actually both immobile uh, nutrients. So they're going to be being used 
as the plant's growing. So they'll actually appear in, in, at the same time if it's deficient. So it's, it's so the, the big difference though is calcium r r deficiencies, you could see holes in your leaves or you could see a, a like, um, cro like crosis in the leaves, like spots. But in this one, you're, you're gonna see more like brown spots and it's different. And if, you're, if you download the presentation, you're gonna be able to see exactly what I'm describing. Once you see it, you'll be able to distinguish it 100% from calcium deficiency. I've actually come across this a handful of times and I can't even count the number of times somebody has commented on my forum, for example, posted a picture like this and thought it was calcium. So they just up the CalMag and they're doing more harm than good, right? Because they're not actually fixing the problem there. So this gets mixed up with calcium deficiency so much. And, and you know, you already said that, but the yellowing that kind of goes along in with like the, the spotting, I think that's a major indicator that it's actually manganese and not calcium. That is actually a great observation, Chris. And it's something, it's so funny. It's, it's not until someone points it out that you begin to notice it yourself, right? I, I fixated on that brown for so, so long that if, I think if I would have presented it the way you just described, exactly the, the yellowing that falls along with it, uh, manganese, 100%. That's a great way. And it's like a, a random yellowing. It's not your typical yellowing that you'd see off of uh, magnesium deficiency, where it's like the intervenal corrosis. It's like just scattered and random on the leaf. It's super interesting. And when you go back to that, the slide right before it, what does manganese do, right? Chlorophyll. Uh, and we're, we're talking about that. We're, we're describing the, what the mineral is doing if it's deficient within the plant and we're seeing it too. And I love that. That's beautiful, Chris. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, so benefits of boron. This is, I love boron. Boron is the throttle to sugar transportation and is responsible for moving the energy into growing parts of the plant. It plays a key role in integrated pest management. Boron also plays a key role in cell wall formation and the functional integrity of biological membranes specifically helps move the energy in the last three weeks of the plant's life cycle. So it moves that sugar into the fruiting and pollination and seed setting. So again, if you want really strong, long lasting, flavorful food, nutritional dense food where the, where the flavor actually lingers in your mouth and you, you, your mouth kind of waters, that's because there's boron, because it's shifting the, the sugars. It plays a role in membrane metabolism and function, thereby being involved in enzyme reaction, as well as the transportation for ions, metabolites, and hormones. Boron is required in very small amounts. It is an immobile nutrient, so look to the new release to identify deficiencies and toxicities. So with this picture I, pre I presented, and Chris, just uh, this obviously this picture isn't going to be available as well because we're showing a can of picture. Make sure to download the presentation. But uh, just to kind of highlight what we were talking about a little bit before, do you when you see this picture, you're seeing the 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 rust and the brown happening in in the in the leaves. But when you look at the flower, the flower is like almost near maturity, and you could tell like you'll see the deficiency happen almost when this. At, at the near end of flowering and, and why is that right well it's because boron is responsible for transferring those sugars especially in those last three weeks so you're going to see the the expression of a deficiency more often than a toxicity with boron and it's and it's going to show up when when the majority of the enzymatic production is happening for that plant for boron i've actually never come across this before it's so rare and great picture by the way really good picture there once i've seen it like once personally in my in my whole life too it's it's a very you don't see it very much and it's because these these other minerals some of a lot of these minerals uh they 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 like we were talking about before there's essential minerals and beneficial minerals right and these beneficial minerals um, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more in the next slide as well, but beneficial minerals, they can be replaced by other minerals. So they don't, they don't think they're absolutely essential. So if you have like the, uh, enough of the right chemistry, it, these, these minerals can be interchangeable with other, with other ones. And so that's why they don't really appear as they don't really appear much just because there's enough chemistry to, to do the function 
it and but it's not the same thing but it it does what it needs to do okay so cobalt the cobalt is a beneficial nutrient for single cell organisms human beings and other mammals but it has not been considered as an essential micronutrient for plants does that make any sense instead this element along with other elements like aluminum selenium silicon titanium has been considered as a beneficial element for plants a beneficial element can improve plant health and status at low concentrations for the element to be considered an essential it, it must be required by plants to complete its life cycle must not be replaceable by other elements and must directly participate in plant metabolism when you look at that definition it that does make sense right when you when you think about it like that it's like do do i need this to produce leaves and stem and the the seed or the fruit i'm looking for although when you explain what they do it it you begin to wonder why isn't it considered a beneficial mineral so cobalt inhibits the formation of ethylene and delays senescence uh, senescence it basically it slows aging so cobalt is a is an anti anti-aging mineral basically aging and maturing are different things you you can still mature without aging so aging is being brittle slow and weak maturing is reaching your highest potential and all of us have seen it when you have like this amazing grow like you at the very end even when the atherocyacin's happening the purple and the leaves are happening the plant still looks like it can keep going the, that's because it's matured it it hasn't it hasn't really aged cobalt and rhizosphere bacteria are responsible in growing root tips and synthesizing cytokinins we pay a lot of money for insect frass mushroom compost and kelp why because of cytokinins Cytokinins are plant hormones that regulate plant growth and so much more. Rhizobia and other nitrogen fixation bacteria require cobalt for fixing atmospheric denitrification into ammonia, providing plants with an essential macronutrient of nitrogen. So I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but this is starting to sound like a conspiracy. Now listen to what I just said a second ago. Cobalt is required it is the it, one of the required elements to to turn the gas in the atmosphere into usable nitrogen so but they don't say it's an essential mineral like but the chemists know this you know if you really think about that if you could add a trace mineral in so that you wouldn't have to use another uh something you have to purchase to keep more money in your pocket but they call this a, a beneficial mineral versus an essential mineral Mm, this is where I begin to think about things differently. Cobalt plays a vital role in the integration with iron, nickel, and zinc in maintaining cellular homeostasis. Similar to other micronutrients, plants respond to cobalt concentrations in soil at low concentrations. It promotes plant growth, but it causes phototoxicity at higher concentrations. So let's talk about nickel, another beneficial nutrient. Nickel is used 10 times less than molybdenum. Nickel is a component for some plant enzymes, most notably ure ureus, which metabolizes urea nitrogen into usable ammonia within the plant. Without nickel, toxic levels of urea can accumulate within the tissue, forming necrotic lesions in the leaves. So again, think about that for a second, right? They're, they sell farmers urea perfectly knowing that the plant can't take it up can't utilize it and then the plant says okay guys if you just give me a tiny bit of nickel and a little bit of biology i can turn your trash that you're giving me into something usable i find that to be incredibly interesting i find, i realize that at that point bacteria is capable of, of of evolving in its current environment even even though urea is a synthetic fertilizer it's still capable of processing it recent studies have shown that nickel degrades a potent cytotoxin compound naturally produced by cellular metabolism which is produced during stress and that would make sense right you give it a urea what happens plants stretch well 
the nickel helps detox that as the the plant's going through rapid cellular metal metabolism. So if you are using urea, I would highly recommend to use some type of foliar spray or in, implement it in nickel. And if you're wondering if nickels and drops of balance, it is. Examining this role of nickel in the relationship to stress suggests that nickel may have a key participation in plant antioxidant metabolism. So nickel basically helps detox a plant. And the picture I found here really just shows it very well, right? If you are giving too much nitrogen, what happens with the leaves? It, it's dark green, and that's all these free radicals flowing in the leaf. Well, nickel helps detox that into a healthier green. Nickel is important for seed germination. So Chris, you, you do your own genetics, right? S nickel would be in so important for you if you do seed germination. Nickel is also important for bacteria and fungi. Nickel behaves uh, largely like zinc in the soil plant system, but it forms strong chelates with, uh, with soil organic matter, thereby showing closeness to copper, all because it has a divalent and a trivalent property. So remember what we're talking about, a divalent can hold on to two other smaller minerals or two other minerals that have the opposite charge. Well, nickel doesn't just have a divalent uh, uh, property, it also has a trivalent pop property, so it can hold on to three other minerals, but it's used 10 times less than molybdenum, yet it can hold on to three other things. I find that to be, once again, absolutely fascinating. Excess nickel also affects nutrient absorption by roots, impairs plant metabolism, inhibits photosynthesis and transportation, and may also show signs of sucrosis and or necrosis, but that's not always the case. Flowers are often deformed under these conditions. And for nickel deficiency, seeds, uh, seeds that uh, don't have nickel uh, normally won't, won't pop. They, they, they're just inviable, and if they do pop, the more than likely you're not going to be able to bring in a yield. And again, this is just by a, a nickel deficiency that's not a beneficial element. It, they call it, it's not an essential element that's a beneficial element. Actually, uh, I think it was 20 years ago or something, it was enacted as an essential element. So it's the newest one. Yeah, there's 17 essential elements. Nickel was the most recent one, which at around 20 years ago, I believe it was added as an essential element. So. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for correcting me on that. I love I love when people point things out, and I love learning. So thanks again, Chris, for that. So uh, silicon, it's a it's a beneficial element, right? Not essential. Now you got me going. No, I'm just kidding. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Just <laughs> beneficial, non-essential. Cool. Okay. So silicon, and if I say uh, silicone, I don't. I mean silicon. I I have like 20 years of construction behind me, so sometimes I say silicon. Uh, or silicone, I mean. Anyways, so silicon is a beneficial non-mobile nutrient. Microorganisms like Burkholia or Bacillus and other bacteria solubilize different types of silicates, silicates. Silicon benefits plants uh, when under stress. It improves drought tolerance and delays wilting in crops. Enhances the ability to resist micronutrients and other metal toxicities like aluminum, copper, iron, manganese, and zinc, and etc. So just kind of point this out, right? There's a mineral within the, all the other minerals, be, because how do you how do you regulate the trace minerals if they're so small, right? Well, silicon, if it's in an environment, will will hold on to the excess trace minerals so they don't become toxic to your environment. Once again, find that to be absolutely amazing. How perfect the world we live in if we don't mess with it too much. Silicon enhances growth and yield of all annual and vegetable crops, promotes upright growth, stronger and thicker stems, and shorter internodes, provides resistance to bacterial and fungal diseases, decreases some antibiotic stresses as temperature. Silica, which is different than silicon, silicon is silica is processed silicon. Uh, is often alkaline by nature because of the pro of what it does to make it soluble. Therefore, naturally, it's going to increase the pH. And so what you're going to want to do if you're using a liquid silica, you're going to want to add that first, pH your, your water, and then add, then add in your trace minerals like drops of balance and then the rest. If you're wondering if silicon is in drops of balance, it is. And it's in an acidic form, not an alkaline form. Silicon promotes light exposure of leaves and makes an enormous difference in trichrome production. Tro trichomes are mostly silicon. 
Trichomes play a role as a light wave guide for the far infrared. Silicon particles helps far infrared light efficiently propagate inside the trichomes and leaves. These properties are useful for efficiently warming the plant since absorption of far infrared lights is converted to heat. This is due to the photonic band edge at which the velocity of light slows. In other words, silicon gives structure to light as it enters and enhances the reflection and absorption of light. Therefore, plants form trichomes in order to efficiently capture far infrared light, which would be useful for, for the enhancement of photosynthesis. And if I didn't explain that well enough, just to kind of recap on this, Light, light is fast and it's coming through your your plant really fast and if you have silicon it will actually slow the light down capture it better and efficiently guide it to where it needs to go that's what silicon does and so i for me i don't I would i don't understand it, how you could ever be efficient with all the lights that you're using with the and repaying that recurring bill like wouldn't it be cooler if you captured more of that light in your plant that's it's, that's what I think, at least. And you could do that with silicon. I think silicon is one of the most undervalued nutrients out there. I mean, you covered so many benefits. One of the main ones is trichome production. If you look at, I believe it's an electron microscope, and you look at a trichome on a plant that wasn't fed silica versus what was fed silica, you see a massive difference in just the structure of the trichome alone. A lot of people don't know that. And if you are going to supplement silica, a couple things to know, you want silicic acid or orthosilicic acid. Those are the bioavailable forms. Silicon dioxide is not a bioavailable form. So let's forget to add those few things in. I, I love that you brought that up, Chris, because if you want long-term bag appeal with a great nose, you're going to use silicon, right? It's be like what we talked about more. Those trichomes are made mostly of silicon. So if they had more of that structure when they're finished off, do you think they'll be able to retain those terpenes and those oils a little better versus breaking off or, or floating away? This, this, so this is like, we all know this, right? It's like, you look at your buddy's herb and you're like, how old is that? And you're like a year, last year's crop. And you're like, damn, how did it, it looks amazing, right? And that's because they're using the right essential minerals to so that the plant can do with the bacteria so that they can produce the enzymes needed to do its full potential. And like what I was saying, right, they, they call these essential minerals versus beneficial, but we're not, because we eat our food quickly and because th things get thrown away quickly and a lot of herbs, we a lot of people don't see the preservation of herbs long term right and if you if we if if you're taking care of a of, of a crop from one year versus the of let's say you have two different crops and you see you use one with bacteria and that has the right enzymes versus the other one that doesn't the one that the one the, 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 the where you see the difference is a year later where you're still able to sell your crop versus the other one it's already started to degrade and that and, and you don't we don't acknowledge it because it's not now but if we but if we are capable of seeing it long term, we do see the benefit, and these are because of different enzymatic production, different enzymes being produced at different times. Selenium, selenium is considered a beneficial element for higher plants, enhancing antioxidant metabolism, photosynthesis, secondary metabolites, and carbohydrates in in plant leaves. At low concentration, selenium enhances photosynthesis in plants due to increasing protection of light harvesting proteins and photosynthesis pigments called antennae complex, right? And we're talking about enzymes and proteins, right? You need all these things. Bacteria and selenium are closely interlinked as the element serves both essential nutrient requirements and energy generation functions. However, selenium at high levels can be toxic for bacterial homeostasis. Selenium and nickel help detox plant inflammation. And that's what we were talking about before. Free radicals, dark green, it's going to bring it back to being a healthy green. Titanium. Titanium is a semi-mobile beneficial element. Titanium applied via roots or leaves at low concentrations have been documented to improve crop performance through stimulating the activity of certain enzymes enhancing chlorophyll content and photosynthesis, promoting nutrient uptake, strengthening stress tolerance, and improving crop yield and quality. 
it is considered a biostimulant for improving crop production. Titanium's role in plants lies in its interaction with other trace nutrient elements, primarily iron. Iron and titanium have a synergistic and antagonistic relationship. When plants experience iron deficiencies, titanium helps induce the expression of genes related to iron, thereby enhancing iron's uptake and utilization and improving plant growth. So let me explain this a little better. Let's say we, uh, we have a tank of gas and we hold 10 gallons. We use up nine, we have one left, and imagine you were capable of pushing a button to make your engine more sensitive so that one gallon actually acted like 10 gallons of gasoline. That's what titanium does. It makes everything more hypersensitive. So if there's a deficiency or there's not enough in the environment, it will make it enough. I find that to be, once again, for soil that's incredibly depleted, I find titanium should be a, an essential mineral versus a beneficial. Titanium, if you're wondering, is also in drops of balance. The big question, how do I start applying this knowledge today? We have to go from academics to application. I just shared all this knowledge, right? We have to, we have to, go, we have to remember that knowledge is not power. It is the application of knowledge that's power. So we go back to the five most limiting factors that support enzyme production. One, your carbon and your humic layer in your soil. And so your carbon and your humic layer is pit moss. Like I was telling you, it's these fibrous little paper that acts as, as a net that keeps things in places. Because if you're using cocoa or, or, or sphagnum peat moss, all these things, the way they're processed, kind of hold differently. And so when you put your when you put in the, the your nutrients, a lot of these nutrients, was, if you're using dry amendments, will actually fall to the bottom because they're not being captured very well in the media. So once again, pit moss is your carbon, and it's your future home for your microbes and minerals. And why is because the microbes and the minerals need a full 24 hours for those those minerals and those bacteria staying undisturbed in that environment for 24 hours to do to create those enzymes. Two, you need clean and consistent watering practices. So clean is what drops balance. Drops balance cleans over 400 separate, separate man-made chemicals. And your consistent watering practices, well, because of the pit moss, remember no more than 5% in your media to start, it's paper, so it acts as a wicking system throughout your entire media, helping to rebuild your humic layer. So that once you get your compost, go compost going and, and reamending your soil, it, it, it just helps start that process and keeps things together. Three, ionic sulfated trace minerals. That's drops the balance. 64 plus ionic sulfated trace minerals. Four, your biology. Terragonics. It has 80 separate bacteria colonies. Endofungi. We recommend and support recharge or extreme gardening. They're mycos. And then last but not least is your CO2, which is Organishield. Obviously, if you have a bug problem, you need something that's going to kill the bugs immediately. The organic shield does that. But when it breaks down into, into having no residual, it has, breaks down to water, CO2, and sugar, which is your fifth most limiting factor. Okay, so let's wrap this up and, and, and understand why is this significant, right? Well, photosynthesis. What do you actually need for photosynthesis to do their job, to do its job? You need CO2, water, magnesium, iron, manganese, nitrogen, zinc, titanium, silicon, nickel, cobalt, molybdenum, sulfur, and bacteria. You have that, your photosynthesis is going to do its job and it's going to do it to the best of its ability. If you're missing one of these things, I promise you, you're not going to see the full potential of the plants and how you measure that is in the terpene profiles at the end of your grow. Let's go to the next most uh, the next one that you should really pay attention to. First one was capturing the light, right? The next one is your IPM, your integrated pest management, because bugs can really do damage. And wouldn't it be nice if you if you had the ability to add in the right things, um, bugs wouldn't be attracted to to your plants because the the leading reason why they think bugs are actually attracted to plants is because of excess enzymes on those plants. And why is that? Well, it's because bugs actually don't have a uh, the ability to 
produce enzymes. They don't have their own digestive enzymes. So they actually have to go rob them from another place to do their job. And that would make sense, right? Nature is trying to create a situation for, for to clean up its own mess. So how do you fix this? Well, you fix this by, by giving the plant what it needs so it can complete its 24 hour cycle of their enzyme production. So what do you actually need so your plants are less attractive? Well, you need magnesium, you need sulfur, you need molybdenum, you need boron, you need sugar, selenium and nickel and bacteria, all staying in the same spot for 24 hours. And if you did that, there's a very good chance you're probably never going to have a, a bug breakout. You'll probably still have some bugs, but for the most part, they're, they're not gonna be attracted to your crop. They'll be attracted to your buddies. Scientists try to replace bacteria and say they are creating the same amount of enzymes. What do you think? I'm confused. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, a lot of good information there. Some of these essential elements, some non-essential elements, but are beneficial elements. You definitely did a great job with this presentation. And I'm super thankful that you, uh, that you came on here and, uh, and spilled this knowledge for us for a second time around. Tell us, where can people find you? You can find me over at Perfect Gardens TV. Uh, obviously, um, I work with Perfect Gardens. And also, I highly ask to subscribe to the Perfect Gardens YouTube channel, always helps. And if you guys ever want a part three, uh, just let me know. Uh, I could definitely, I love this subject about gardening, and I could definitely make a, a part three about something new and interesting if you're interested. Just leave a comment down below. Yeah, I think between the part one and part two, we covered all of the essential elements except for chlorine, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So I might have to drag you back for a part three so we can, we can finish up the essential elements. And I know there's a lot more non-essential elements that we could potentially cover in the future as well. So if you want a part three, comment down below, write part three, and uh, maybe we can get Mark back for part three. Mark, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast once again. This has been awesome. I've learned so much. This is one that I'm going to look back at and continue to learn more and more and more every time I watch it because it's a lot of information, really tough to absorb it all in one run, basically impossible to absorb it all in one run unless you're one of those people who have a sponge for a brain and can't, can't absorb it all in one run. But uh, this is something that is definitely going to be on the rerun. I, I agree with you, man. This this. This is an incredibly uh, con confusing and complex topic, and that's why I really tried to break it down to say, hey, listen, guys, the most lim limiting law minimum, your most limiting factor in your garden for especially a biologically alive garden is enzyme production. And instead of trying to get complex in the knowledge, I tried to say, hey, listen, these are the products out there that are going to solve 80% of your problems immediately. Um, and help you get to this goal. So once again, thank you so much for allowing me to come to this channel and share a little bit. Hit that thumbs up if you haven't already. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single weekend I'm releasing a new Garden Talk podcast episode and I would love for you to tune in to future episodes. Also, we're on all podcast platforms. So if you didn't know, we're not just on YouTube. We are on all podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, so on and so forth. So check us out there if you haven't already. And Apple Podcasts in particular, if you can leave a, a rating and review, that would be super helpful because uh, the more of those, the better. That'll help with ranking, help more people tune into the podcast. So thank you to everyone who leaves a review. Mark, once again, thanks so much. We'll leave it at that. Peace out, everyone. Catch you in the next episode.